Good morning, Grace Gospel family. This is Chaplain Kevin Benton, Jr. I'm going to bring bringing you the word of God on today. Um, as we prepare to, for, to go into this message, I would ask if you would just bow your heads with me for a moment of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord God, we are so grateful to, for the opportunity to be in your presence on today. We pray and ask and thank you in advance for being with us as we deliver this word for those that will hear it. May we all apply it to our lives, God, that we may be greater disciples for you And in this last and evil day. We give your name the glory, the honor, and the praise in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Today I'm going to be coming to you from the book of Habakkuk. Um, if Habakkuk, the first chapter, I'm going to be reading from the Christian Standard Bible. I pray that you will follow along with me as we go through this. All right, so I love the book of Habakkuk. He starts, let's start here in verse 2, and he begins with a complaint that he expresses unto God. And he says, how long, Lord, must I call for help and you do not listen or cry out to you about violence and you do not save? He says, I'm crying out. Literally, he's begging God, and he says that God is not listening about the violence, and he's not saving. He says, why do you force me to look at injustice, and why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Oppression and violence are right in front of me, he says. Strife is ongoing, and conflict escalates. Verse 4 says, this is why the law is ineffective and justice never emerges. For the wicked restrict the righteous, therefore justice comes out perverted. Let's skip on down to the 13th verse where Habakkuk continues his second complaint with God. And he says, God, as a matter of fact, let's start at verse 12. He says, are you not from eternity, Lord my God? My holy one, you will not die. Lord, you appointed them. He's talking about the Babylonians. He says, you appointed them to execute judgment. My rock, you destined them to punish us. Watch what he says. He says in verse 13, your eyes are too pure to look on evil and you cannot tolerate wrongdoing. So why? He asks the question, why do you tolerate those who are treacherous? Why are you silent while one who is wicked swallows up one who is more righteous? I want to talk to you today from the subject of the sin of silence, the sin of silence. We know very little um, about the prophet Habakkuk. We are not told in the scriptures where he was born or who his parents come from. He literally just burst onto the scene in scriptures as one of the minor prophets. Minor in terms of the volume of what he recorded, not in terms of rank or superiority to the other prophets. And honestly, I don't think I've ever heard in all my life of being in church, I don't think I've ever heard a message from the book of Habakkuk. I can pretty sure that some of you, when you heard I was coming from there, was like, man, where is he going with this one today? I don't think I've ever heard anybody preach from the book of Habakkuk. I actually came across it in my devotion this week, and I was blown away as I was reminded of the passion of this prophet as he echoes his complaints unto God. It's one of the most refreshingly honest books of the Bible that I have ever read. And Habakkuk is unique among the biblical prophets because he speaks to God, whereas most biblical prophets, they speak to the people on behalf of God, but Habakkuk speaks to God on behalf of the people. I'm going to say that once again. Most of the biblical prophets spoke to the people on behalf of God, but Habakkuk speaks to God on behalf of the people. His prophecy is written uh, about the time of 609 to 605 BC, which is important to note because at this time in history, God's people, the nation of Israel, the 12 tribes, were split into two kingdoms, all right? The northern kingdom of Israel, called Israel, was composed of 10 tribes, and every single one of their kings was evil. All of them led the people of God into idolatry. So God sent the prophets Jonah and Amos and Hosea and Micah and Isaiah to call Israel, the northern kingdom, to repent. But they persisted in their idolatry. And because of that, God allowed the Assyrian army to come in and completely destroy the people of God in 722 B.C. He literally scatters them across the land, something we call the diaspora. But the southern kingdom is comprised of the remaining two tribes of Israel, of Benjamin and Judah. They literally just called those two tribes Judah. Some of their kings followed God and some of them did not. They kind of rode the roller coaster of whether their kings actually followed after God or whether they persisted in evil. 
But God's intention was for Judah to learn from Israel's example and avoid disaster. However, because they persisted in their evil ways and in their idolatry, God appointed the Babylonian army to execute judgment on Judah. Imagine this now. I need you to really understand this story. God has chosen in his infinite wisdom to pour out, to use a pagan evil nation. He's chosen to use Judah's enemies to execute judgment on God's righteous people. I don't know how you feel about that, but Habakkuk, he had a problem with that. Habakkuk was not feeling the idea, and he refuses to be silent about the fact, and he expresses his displeasure to God in this prophecy. Now, this is where personally I love the Bible because I love the Bible when it is honest about the things that people are feeling and it doesn't gloss over them and make it seem like they understand everything and every decision that God has made. And maybe it's just you, but I can imagine that Habakkuk and even myself when I'm reading this, I'm saying, God, you could have used the plague. You could have sent an angel down. You could have sent a famine. You had all these other options. Why would you allow a pagan evil nation to come and judge your people? And a buckhuck had a problem with this. And so I don't know about you, but it's me. Sometimes I don't always understand. And if I can be honest with you, I don't always agree with the way that God decides to do things. But he's God. And let's just be honest, he can do it like that. But I'm grateful that I'm not the only one in the world that when God makes a decision, that I'm not the only person that sometimes feels like, God, I don't understand this. And I got some questions. So I love the book of Habakkuk. So my first point is that Habakkuk, he wrestles. We can see in the scriptures that he wrestles with this idea and he openly, honestly, and candidly, he cries out. He literally begs God to answer him because he's wrestling with God's decision to judge his people Judah using unrighteous evil people. Habakkuk feels like God has turned a blind eye to injustice. It would be one thing. If God was unable to do anything about it, but it's another thing entirely when we know that God has the power to deal with injustice, but he does not do so. Maybe that's just me. What do we do when we know that God is available, when we know that God is able, but he's silent? What do we do when we see injustice happening in the world and we know that our God has the power to heal? We know that he has the power to save, but instead of doing something about it in that moment, our God is silent. And as a proud African-American chaplain preaching to a predominantly African-American audience, I believe it's safe to assume that we understand Brother Habakkuk's complaints. If there's anybody who knows what it's like to suffer injustice at the hands of unrighteous people, it would be us. It is my contention and conviction that the only thing worse than the sin of injustice is the sin of silence in the face of it. I'm going to say that again. The only thing worse than the sin of injustice itself is the sin of silence in the face of it. For people that will see injustice happening in the world, but they don't say anything about it. It would not only be sinful, but in my opinion, it would be shameful of me to mount the pulpit today and not speak to the melanated people of God made in his image about the lack of justice that we have experienced. From suffering through America's original sin to watching two more young, unarmed African Americans be denied due process under the law and be unnecessarily killed, one of them on videotape, it is heartbreaking. And we feel, we feel that as people of God. These are just two of the examples of the scores of unarmed African Americans we have watched needlessly die at the hands of people who are unable at that moment to see the value of the lives of these people who, like them, are made in the image of God. In the last six years, 241 unarmed African Americans were killed by police officers. Worse, in every inst in almost every instance, they are denied justice in this life and in death as 99% of the killings from 2013 to 2019 have not resulted in officers even being charged with a crime. So when Habakkuk says that the law is ineffective and justice emer never emerges for the wicked restrict the righteous, therefore justice comes out perverted, we comprehend all too well what he's saying. I feel you on that one, my brother. We comprehend all too well what he's saying. The Message Bible says you can't be serious. You can't condone evil. So why don't you do something about this? 
Why are you silent now? This outrage, evil men swallow up righteous and you stand around and watch. I don't know about you, but I feel sometimes and we feel sometimes as if God is not doing anything, even though we know he can see the injustice that's happening in the world. So Habakkuk wrestles. Point number one is that he wrestles with God. He wrestles with understanding the God that he loves so much with understanding how God is silent in the face of injustice. Point number two is that not only does Habakkuk wrestle, but he watches. He has a keen eye. And he says in chapter two, verse one. He says, I will stand at my guard post and I will station myself on the lookout tower and I will watch to see what he will say to me and how I should reply to my com about my complaint. The scriptures declare that like a soldier, Habakkuk takes up a position at watch and eagerly stands and he's waiting on God's response. He says, I, I, I'm so glad to know that I serve a God who I can express my frustrations, my fears, my anxiety, my anger. I can express all of these things to him because the scriptures told me that I serve a God who says that I can cast all of my cares upon him knowing that he cares for me. I'm so glad, saints of God, that I don't have to hide from God. I don't have to lie to him. I don't have to be afraid to come to him with my questions because our God is simultaneously transcendent and divine but still personal and desires intimate relationship with me he's omnipotent meaning he's all powerful but yet he allows us to participate in his purposes our God is omnipresent meaning he is in all places at all times but yet and we still declare that he is Emmanuel he is God with us he's omniscient which means that he knows everything there is to know in the world but still he wants to hear my voice that's the kind of God that we serve he's perfect and he's holy and he's without sin but yet Paul says that he loves us enough that he made the one who did not even know sin to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God y'all didn't hear me on today he said that the one who was not even knew sin he became sin so that we might put on his righteousness that was the great exchange he took on my sin and gave him my righteousness that's the kind of God we serve and I'm so glad that I ain't got to pull punches with God in my prayer but I can tell you exactly how I feel when we see injustice in the world hallelujah Job says what is man that thou art so mindful of him that you should magnify him and that you set your heart upon him, Job 7 and 17. David says, look at the splendor of your skies, your creative genius glowing in the heavens. When I gaze at your moon and your stars mounted like jewels in their settings, I know that you are a fascinating artist who fashioned all of these things. But when I look up and I see such wonder and when I see such workmanship above, I have to ask you this question compared to all of your cosmic glory why would you bother with a puny mortal man and be infatuated with Adam's sons have you ever asked yourself the question why with God with everything that he's done why is he so concerned about you and I but I'm so glad that he is Habakkuk knew that even in the midst of his anger he could bring his concerns before God and he was determined to stand in the presence of God until he received an answer to his prayers prayer is always appropriate, beneficial, healing, and necessary, especially in this season. Prayer is not just a one-way communication where we are talking to God, but aren't you so glad that we can also allow God to talk to us in prayer and that we're having a conversation with him in this moment. And we can lay out our concerns before God and then we get in position to, as the old saints used to say, we watch and pray. So Habakkuk wrestles with God he watches for God. And then point number three is that he writes. The Bible says in verse chapter two, verse three, that the Lord answered me. And you heard this passage before. He says, write down the vision, clearly inscribe it on the tablets so that one can easily read it. You heard the scriptures, write the vision and make it plain. God is instructing Habakkuk how to handle the message that he gives him. God commands him to write down the vision. He says, what I am about to reveal to you, it's so important that I need you to write it down. I need it, I need it to be so boldly and so clearly seen 
mean that any person that when they're running by, they can comprehend the message even if they only see it while they're on the run. He says it's so plain that I want people to be able to take it from village to village when they run by. It would be similar to the modern day advertisements that we see on the billboard. Uh, uh, God said to a buck up, write down what I'm about to tell you. Put it on the billboard so that everybody that sees can tell what I'm about to say. He says the vision that I'm about to explain to you is for an appointed time. So he says, I need you to do something, Habakkuk. I need you to wait for it. He says, I need you to wait for it. God is saying, I have a solution. I got the answer to your problems, but it's going to happen on my timetable time and not yours. Habakkuk's responsibility is to be prepared to preserve the word of God when he sends it. He says, write it down. Be prepared to speak about it. Anticipate what I'm about to tell you and then communicate it to my people. I don't know about you, but when we come to the house of God, we ought to come in the house of God prepared. If we're really expecting God to speak, how many people come into the house? of God with notes how many of you come in with your iPads ready that when God speaks the word that we can write down the word what he says and communicate it to somebody else come on in your virtual rooms come on clap your hands and tell God thank you so he says to God I'm ready to receive it I'm prepared for it I'm ready to write it down I'm ready to preserve it and I'm ready to communicate it I'm ready to preach it I'm prepared I'll preserve it and I'll preach it so he says, write down God's vision, not our own. Woo, I'm going to say that again. He says, write down God's vision. I've heard this scripture preached over and over again, but it's about our dreams and our goals and what we want to accomplish. But God said, I don't want you to write down your vision, Habakkuk. I need you to write down my vision. And because the Bible is not the revelation about who we are, it is God's self-revelation about who he is. The Bible is not about us. It's not about our dreams and our goal and our next season and our breakthrough and our next season and our promotion. It's about snowing who he is and being declared who God is so he says write down my vision and make it plain and he says here is the message this is the meat of the matter he says those who are evil will not survive but those who are righteous the Bible says the just shall live by their faith somebody say the just shall live by faith he says to them that you have robbed cities and nations everywhere. He's talking to the Babylonians now. He says, you robbed nations and cities everywhere on earth and you murdered my people. Now those who survive will be as cruel to you as you were to them. He says he's talking to the Babylonians and he says to let them know that you who performed injustice, you who are oppressing other people, now it's your turn to be impressed. Now because you didn't value the lives of my people, now they're not going to value your lives. He says injustice will not go unpunished oppression will not go unpunished because God has a plan to deal with it all he says in chapter 2 verse 14 for the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of God's glory as the waters cover the sea God says that the nations will be covered with my glory so I encourage you with this last final point that as we address Habakkuk wrestles with the word of God then he watches for the word of God to come forward. Then he writes the vision down. And then last of all, he waits. Chapter 3, verse 16 says, Now I quietly wait for the day of distress to come against the people that are invading us. In, in, in verses 17 through 19, this is what I love. He says, watch this. He says, the fig trees may no longer bloom. Our vineyards may no longer produce grapes. Olive trees may be fruitless. And harvest time might be a failure. Sheep pens may be empty. And cattle stalls may be vacant. He's saying all of these things may take place. There may be bad news everywhere. But he says, I will still celebrate because God still saves. The Lord gives me strength. Is there anybody that says in the midst of a Oppression, in the midst of racism, in the midst of injustice, in the midst of seeing all of this stuff going on in the world that we know is wrong and we see it. How many people know that in the midst of it all, I'm still going to celebrate my God. I'm still going to walk by faith and not by sight. I'm still going to live for those things that are eternal and not for those things that are temporal. God, no matter how long it takes, my trust is in you. I trust in your character. I trust in your word. I trust in your promises. I trust in your commandments. I trust in your statutes. I trust in you and I know that you have a plan to deal with all of the injustice and the evil that we 
we see in the world, and I will wait on you. But while I'm waiting on you, I'm not going to wait idly by. He says, I'm going to wait like the person at the restaurant that comes in and checks on you. Do you need some more water? Can I give you some more of this? God says, I need some people that while they're waiting on me to do something about evil, will wait on me and say, God, in the midst of it, I'll still give you praise. In the midst of it, I'll still give you glory. In the midst of it, I will still express my faith in you. I will not doubt you because I know your character. Habakkuk waits for the day of distress and God's eventual punishment of Babylon according to his prophetic word, yet he rejoices because he trusts in God's sovereignty. And likewise, I encourage each and every one of us today, no matter who you are or where you are, that are feeling discouraged, that may be feeling a little bit emotional about the events that are going on in the world, I encourage you today to be encouraged, to walk by faith and not by sight, that even as we behold racism, oppression, evil, and injustice, now the day of God's judgment and punishment of evil, it is coming. God is not going to stand idly by and watch injustice, and neither should we. We should not be silent. We can express our concerns. We can express our frustrations. We can bring them to God because we know that he cares about us. But we will not suffer the sin of silence. Edmund Burke says that the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. We will not be silent about racism, cruelty, oppression, police brutality, persecution, or injustice against any group of people, whether they because all of us are made in the image and in the likeness of God. We will not stand idly by and watch any group of people be oppressed and be restricted from their God-given rights seeing them abused. We will cry loud and spare not and advocate against injustice for women, children, the elderly, homeless, prisoners, widows, illegal aliens, and any group of people who are being denied their fundamental rights as a human being. We will not be silent. We will not suffer from the sin of silence. We will cry loud to God and spare not. I encourage you as we bring this to a close, talk to God about your fears, your frustrations, your emotions, your anxiety, but in the midst of it all, trust in him, for the just shall live by faith. We trust in the character of our God because we know that in this life or the next, he has a plan to punish those who have been operating in evil, but to reward those who continue to walk in righteousness. Be blessed on this week. Father, we thank you for encouraging us through your word. We thank you for not keeping secret the, the, the heart and the complaints that Habakkuk expressed unto you. We're so grateful to you that we can come to you with all of our emotions and everything that we're feeling and that you will answer us. Answer us, God, in this season expeditiously for your people so desperately need to hear from you. We love you, God. We trust in your character and we will wait until our change comes. In Jesus' name, amen.